So again, welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, Wildlife Adaptations for Survival, Change, Move, or Withstand, Exploring the Alaska Wildlife Curriculum. So today we're gonna to be diving into the Alaska Wildlife Curriculums. Um, it's a free resource provided by the Alaska Department of Fish and Games Wildlife Division. So we will learn more about <clears throat> what the curriculum offers, how you can use it tomorrow, and then get a taste of what a unit looks like um, together. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our presenter today, Brenda Duty. So Brenda is the Alaska Wildlife Coordinator um, for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game for the last 12 years. Prior, she worked for the Water Division um, of DEC as an outreach specialist in the Alaska Museum of the North in the Education Department. Um, formal, formal education, um, oh, in the education department um, for formal education is in the rural, is in rural development with emphasis on land and renewable resources from UAF. Um, she is a wife and mother of seven kids, age 13 to 40, uh, a grandma to seven, ages three to 19, and they've all been raised in the outdoors in some remote locations. Um, Brenda loves gardening, subsistence fishing, and gathering, nature in general. She's thankful to live in Alaska. And I will turn it over to you, Brenda. Oh, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. It's exciting to um, see your interest in um, the natural world. And, you know, wildlife is a really great topic to um, engage students to learn more because it's just generally um, very interesting and, and kids want to know more about it. So um, today we're going to go through the process of not only learning about the, the lessons or the materials, but how to demonstrate those a little bit like we've talked about and some other resources that you can build on um, to create that unit and also address different learning styles and adjust for age differences in your group and the groups that you might be um, encountering. Um, so, but first I've got a couple of questions for you. And um, I'm hoping that you will take this little poll and see what you think. Can it be real? Just go ahead and vote on a few questions for us, please. It's okay if you're not sure what the answer is, take a risk, just give it a go, be brave. Looks like we have almost everyone. <laughs> All right, let's give it 10 more seconds. And then we will watch the clock. All right. Brenda, I don't know if you see the results, but we are sharing, sharing the results. results. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about this question, can it be real? Because just about all of the inquiry we do with students is really about formulating a great question. So I can tell you, well, this is real or not real, but today we're gonna to demonstrate how you can show that something is real and um, those step-by-step -step instructions to make that happen. Um, so this little poll is something you can actually do with students or your, your learners, um, I put together some envelopes asking the very questions that you were asked in this poll. And inside um, is the answer. So this one is a plant that was once a tree and has sand in its stem. Is that true? Yes, the horsetail, the good old horsetail. These are the ecology cards that are available for you to use with students. There are 270 cards in this pack. And in the back, they actually have an F, T, or W up in the corner, forest, tundra, or wetland. It gives its traits and um, 
what it eats, who eats it, and where you can find it, and little known facts here on the bottom. It turns out in dinosaur days, horse tails were tree size. Imagine um, how big that tree must have been. What about a fish that can breathe out of water? Hmm. Some of you said yes. Yes, the blackfish. The blackfish is only found in Alaska and uh, parts of, of Russia. And uh, during the low water times, it can lay out on the tundra for up to three weeks because it adjusts its breathing so that it can actually get its oxygen from the air instead of the dissolved oxygen in water. That is pretty amazing adaptation. Um, and today we're gonna to be focusing on adaptations um, in plants and in animals. Are there meat eating plants in Alaska? Winter, winter chicken dinner, there sure are. There's a couple of them actually, the sundew and the bladderwort. And you can find these in the wetlands of Alaska, which is about 43% of our state. Again, that information is on the back of these cards. So the one that I think that maybe was a little bit confusing for, for folks was a bird that eats its own feathers. Yeah, there is a bird that eats its own feathers, but it, it, it adopted this behavior to, um, that's a grebe, um, to protect their stomachs and intestines from sharp fish bones. So as this is just one way that you can pique the interest of your learners, get them to start investigating a little bit, maybe a little bit of reading in there as well, and learn a little bit about the phenomenon of the, the place that they live. That's actually a great way to kind of um, induce students to want to know more or to do more, um, to find out what they can about um, those different topics. So I encourage you to check those out. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you just where you can find those here um, shortly. Maybe I can do that very quickly, actually. I'll share my screen. And I'm not seeing Brenda, I think you're showing your PowerPoint. Oh, yep. There we go. Yeah, here, this is where the, this is the pack of the ecology cards. These are online um, and we'll go through where you can find that exactly. But like I said, it has the, all of these illustrations that were actually put together by an Alaskan artist, Conrad Fields here um, down in, on the Kenai. They're all numbered, which is the saving grace of using these cards because you want to keep them in order. And it's a great way to build food chains, um, to also demonstrate the correct anatomy or illustration of these different species. That's really important if you, your, your learners want to learn how to draw some of these animals. Um, like I said, food chains, food webs, um, you can, put one of these on their forehead and, and they can guess, you know, try to ask yes or no questions to figure out who their wildlife species is. So it can be a whole lot of fun for them um, as well. Brenda, sorry, I don't, sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't, you're not sharing. I wasn't sure if you were trying to screen share the website. Let's try. Have you seen that now? Awesome. So this is what that pack of cards looks like that I was just droning on about. Um, we'll go over once we look at the website, what exactly, you know, where exactly you can find that. And we set it up so, you know, you had just have to know um, how to get to the education page. So that will be the big um, benefit there. Okay, um, so what is the Alaska Wildlife Curriculum? That's a very good question. Uh, let's see if I can get to that website quickly. There we go. Um, if you go to the Fish and Game website, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and just type in Alaska Wildlife Curriculum, it will take you right to the curricula home. 
And today we're really going to be focusing more on winter adaptations and um, looking at the, the different elements of tundra in particular. The nice thing about the wildlife curriculum, all five volumes, is they spend a lot of time in the beginning really helping you learn about what this topic is about. It gives you those strategies for help for under for explaining concepts to your learners, but it also helps enrich you, your understanding. So you feel like you feel comfortable about teaching some of these uh, materials. And you can download this PDF for free. You can copy off the whole thing. You can just you know, print off different pages that you might need um, as you're putting together art or planning. This is a great way to go through um, the different guides and um, help you to build your concept. Maybe you wanna take a snippet out of each one of those guides that's perfectly possible to do. Um, so this is the flat one dimensional opportunity for learning about the Alaska wildlife curriculum. It's been around for about 35 or 40 years, well before my time. So um, it's been very successful, but you'll also see that there's there are more uh, types of curricula below the bears. Alaska. Sorry, you're still sharing. You're still sharing the ecology cards. <laughs> Sorry about that. Since I'm screen sharing here on my end. Are you seeing the wildlife curriculum? Awesome. All right. So this is the teacher resources call. You can just type in the Alaska wildlife curriculum and it will take you right to the guide. You can download the whole thing or you can just print off what you need as I've mentioned before. If you look in the left-hand column, you'll see that there's furs of Alaska mammals, um, information about ice fishing even, or the skulls of Alaska mammals. These are great places to learn about the adaptations and extra activities in those focused areas. So I encourage you to shop through here um, and really get an idea of what's available for um, you as well. Okay, um, let's see, let's try, let's try, uh, seeing if we can take a look at a couple of uh, activities that you might want to do. Um, or let's do the, the presentation first. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Not yet, it's still on the website. Are you seeing me? Yes, we are. You're not screen sharing anything right now. Sorry about that, folks. Are you seeing survival strategies for survival yet? Yes. Awesome. Terrific. All right. So I just want to try to 
go through um, a couple of strategies for survival that we were talking about a little bit earlier. And by the way, I can make this PowerPoint available to you to adapt with some comments in it if you choose to use this with your, your um, learners as well. So there are three major strategies for survival. First is migration, leaving the area to avoid the snow and cold. I know some humans that do that. Even. Um, some snowbirds, they just leave that basic area. Then there's hibernation or sleep the winter away. So we have to be really thoughtful when we think about hibernation because not all wildlife are true hibernators. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then there is adaptation or resistance. Like they, their body changes or their um, circumstances change so that they can actually withstand the cold or the snow. So you know, migration is just a case of leaving town. Um, although right now we see a lot of those birds coming back, they've come back from a very long way. Uh, our godwits were just in New Zealand not too long ago. They're on their way back here. And just recently, um, there's been some questions about maybe bats are hibernating or are they migrating locally um, or regionally? Well, it turns out that they do hibernate um, and they group together to keep each other warm during that hibernation time. But there are also migrations that are a little more local, like from the higher elevation to lower elevation. Um, caribou will do that during the season, but they also have very long migrations and very large migrations. So um, when you're talking about different species, it's good to know what type of migration you're at me talking about. Hibernation. Okay, so here's a list of wildlife that do use hibernation um, or a, a type of change of behavior to survive. Bears and ground squirrels, marmots, jumping meadow mouse, insects and amphibians. Now, this little guy is a ground squirrel. Ground squirrels are true hibernators. In fact, this picture, you see this person is holding this ground squirrel that is in hibernation state. It's actually a teacher at one of our workshops. They passed this ground squirrel around and it did not stir uh, because it's, it's all about the temperature in the room. We couldn't hold on to it for too long. We had to keep moving it um, to make sure that we didn't warm it up too much. But like bears, I mean, excuse me, um, ground squirrels and Frogs, for example, are true hibernators. You can't have a baby if you're truly hibernating. Now, torpor is a little bit different, and that's what bears do. They take a, they take a heavy nap. They don't urinate or defecate in their dens, but they do get up and move around. And sometimes they come all the way out of their den and go back in. And of course, they have their young um, during that time. An avastation is when um, amphibians in particular will burrow themselves underneath um, the leaf litter during the summertime or in the fall to keep moist and to keep cool. So that's a little bit uh, different than um, what we kind of give as a blanket explanation of hibernation. So those are all behaviors that help them survive those dramatic changes or whatever they need to do to um, to make it through the seasons. I have my friend the bear, which are starting to wake up now, and, and uh, quite a few of them. Um, resistance is um, all the other animals that stay active in the wintertime. We have to adjust to the conditions in order to survive. Um, so adaptations to winter include you know, having those really big feet so that you can float on top of the snow. Um, even birds have those hairy feet. Um, my friend, the polar bear here, a little bit of polar bear fur. Uh, you can see the claw in here, but fur all the way around it to make sure to give it that float uh, effect as well, and a little more traction on the snow. So the different types of adaptations, of course, are color change, more fur, more fat, large feet, 
and large overall size. Behavioral changes are snow roosting, essentially a, a snow cave or shivering. We certainly do all of that. Communal roosting, we like to cuddle when it's cold or just living under the snow for that extra insulation. Let's talk a little bit about color change to begin with. Okay, here's, where's Walden? When you find the snowshoe pair, go ahead and um, let us know in the chat. Have you found it? Can you find it? I'll give you a few seconds. Ready? There it is. The snowshoe hair actually uses two techniques. It, of course, changes color, but it also stays completely still. You literally almost can't see this hair unless you know what to look for. Let's take a look at it in another season. If we are up close, it's the eye that gives it away, really. Let's see, we've got another hair in here. Let me know when you can see it. Ready? There it is, way back there perfectly um, adapted and with its behavior and the color change to be in this environment. It's a great matchup. Oh, it was way back in here. You can tell that it's kind of a fall time. Obviously the leaves are on the ground. And if you look at that hair, it's starting to turn just a little bit. But what happens when the season doesn't cooperate with your color chain. You're left kind of vulnerable out there. So um, that's something that wildlife have to deal with in that case. Good thing hairs are pretty fast. So ermine, that short-tailed weasel. Oh my gosh, so adorable. How cute can that possibly be? Well, they're turning color um, in the winter time obviously to match in the snow to, to um, be able to escape predators on the snow. But what about that black tail? Doesn't that kind of give them away? So why do they have that black tail? Everything in nature has a purpose. There's a reason for it. And scientists think that it's because the black tail is so far away from its head. If, you're, if it's gonna get attacked, Usually um, a predator will see their black tail and go for it instead of their head. So they're more likely to survive if the predator goes for their tail. So it makes perfect sense. Um, they're also quite, quite vicious little animals. They can uh, take down a bird um, and oftentimes they're very aggressive around a wood, wood pile. They're not very afraid of humans at all. Who else turns white? I don't know, our state bird. There's actually three types of ptarmigan um, in Alaska, so we can learn a little bit about that as well. But you can imagine the benefit of having uh, your color the same as your background. It's definitely going to help you uh, survive in the winter time. What about feet? Feet are a great topic to talk about for adaptations. Look at those hair toes when they're splayed out like that that is a really big hair foot um and you can see them better in the winter time by their tracks but this is a really great track image because you can see the toes very plainly and see what direction that hair is going if you can't see the toe prints sometimes people get mixed up in that the track uh, is actually going the other direction or the, the animal is going the other direction because they think that uh, just they're not understanding how that hair actually springs forward and where their back feet land. So look very carefully for those uh, toe marks if you can. And this man's name is Bob Hunter. He did a great job of making sure that we had some sort of a measurement out there for scale so that we could see just how big that hair actually was. 
So who eats snowshoe hare? Well, another species that um, is able to float on the snow and has some really big paws. Take a look at those, how those paws splay out. This is Alaska's uh, only cat, the lynx. And you'll also notice that lynx has those little tufts of hair on top. Um, there's not a conclusive answer of what that um, adaptation does for lynx, um, but it sure is an identifying mark. Some people say, well, what's the difference between a, a lynx and a bobcat? They're very close, but lynx is generally bigger. And um, more snowshoes on different birds as well. Um, when you're, you're looking at the toes of this grouse, those uh, hairs on there are just bristly. They're really hard. Um, and the tufted uh, feathers in between the toes really help it to have some good traction in the snow. There's a great activity called uh, snow floats that we can provide for you from the below zero curriculum guide. This is from our neighbors in Canada that just talks about um, what that load is like. You can actually do the math. I mean, I can tell you that these animals kind of float on the snow, but here's a mathematical way that you can um, also figure that out as well. So we can make that available to you if you're interested. Or how big, here's a great question, how big do your students' feet need to be to achieve the, the foot load of a lynx, essentially like a snowshoe? So if you're living in a traditional um, situation, you can, you know, you maybe know people who have made snowshoes. Well, they had to figure out how big that snowshoe had to be to um, transfer the load over um, that space so you didn't sneak, um, sink into the snow. And so this is a, the actual mathematical equation to help you figure that out with um, your students. You can add in a little bit of math as well. Another behavioral strategy is snow roosting. Ptarmigan will, and grouse will just take a dive into the deep snow and make a little snow cave. And even if it's 32 degrees um, or 32 below zero above ground, in that little cave, it's, it can be as warm as zero degrees, which is pretty chilly, but it's a lot warmer than it would if it were above the snow. And this is what those roosts look like. You can see that they burrowed right in. And, if you find this, you might also see their predators' um, tracks as well, which would be potentially lynx or fox. So these are observations that students could potentially see in reality um, for when they're looking for roosting. Another way that they, they survive, other animals survive is actually um, creating, when they don't have enough fat, they might go into a submivian environment. So that's these voles and shrews that dig down right down to the grass and they create these little highways um, underneath snow. And they also create a little bit of heat when they're going through their highways. If you're looking over a snowed area, you'll see a little bit of a sink. And that's because of their heat um, that they, they create through there. So well, that's just one way that they can um, stay alive and keep moving. Also their predators like those ermine will be glad to be down there to around the corner um, for a snack as well. So that's really important. Um, our chickadees can remember up to 200 locations where, the, for where they have stashed food um, over the, the fall time. Um, that little old chickadee, who would know? So um, these are just some other ways that if they don't have a lot of fat, they have got to protect themselves somehow. Um, beaver. Those beaver lodges are really great little fortress. You notice that they keep a food cache under the water and another um, pile a little bit further away from that beaver dam so that they have a, an escape route in the event that they are attacked by fox or somebody else um, digs them out. So actually, you know, 
caching their food is kind of what we maybe even humans do sometimes as well. Beavers are all over Alaska, so they're a great example, a great um, species to check out. Now, there's a couple of rules about how um, things that help you to adapt to stay uh, successful through the winter time. One is Bergman's rules. In fact, you know, our moose are much larger than moose in uh, northern Minnesota or in Maine. In those places, so the bigger you are, the more likely you are to survive. Or Allen's rule that says the appendages and surface areas make a big difference. You can see this fox with the big ears that's a, in the desert, or our Arctic fox has very short ears that are close to its body to help it uh, retain heat um, during those colder times. And we're going to talk about that snowshoe hare and the jackrabbit here shortly. Another countercurrent uh, heat exchange mechanism. Raise your hand in the chat if you've ever heard of this before, would you? Anybody? Yeah, this is um, kind of a neat uh, adaptation using the warm blood from the artery and the cold blood from the vein as it circulates through their appendages. Um, if, if you have your veins and arteries very close to one another, they actually sort of equalize the temperature of the blood that's going into your feet. So there's um, less heat loss and it'll help you keep your feet warmer. So that's how moose, um, wolves, ravens, they don't freeze, the feet don't freeze. Okay, your hooves and fur is also a great way to learn more about staying warm. And again, I talked a little bit about the Alaska wildlife curriculum and then potentially using the furs of Alaska mammals. Um, and there are a bunch of other really great resources that are available for you on our website. Um, these field investigations that we're talking about and uh, some activities that you can do with students are just really a great way for them to learn about asking a good question, developing uh, maybe a way to test that question and see if they can factor out what they're learning about. If you're looking at tracks, what a great way to tell the story of what has happened to you or what wildlife species are in your area. Even if you don't have any wildlife, people are going through that area, and sometimes you can figure out who's been here. Um, I've certainly done that with my teenagers when they were younger. Um, but getting them outside, learning maybe something inside, but then taking them outside so they can see it in reality is, is a changing, life-changing experience. It, it helps them to create that moment that they'll carry with them, regardless if they stay in Alaska or not. Are there any quick questions that I can answer? Okay. Well, let's start off with um, talking a little bit about some of the kits that you could potentially um, check out in the different areas of Alaska, and I'll show you how to find those. One of them is the fur kit. Now, if we want to talk about winter adaptations, if comparing furs is a great way to make that happen. Um, I've used beaver before, but today I actually have a sea otter, a sea otter pelt. Oh man, it is so luxurious and so very soft, but the hairs are super compacted on this, this otter. If you try to spread open, this, these furs, you will not find its skin because they're so packed in there. Up to a million hairs per square inch on a sea otter. So you can imagine, hmm, that's, that's kind of a lot. Let's think about it's another um, marine mammal, a seal. It does not have very thick fur at all. It's compact, it's all, laying in one direction, and that's one way to 
explore furs is to put them in the bags that are in the fur kit. Have your learners give you some words to describe what that fur feels like. Does it go the same direction both ways when you put your hands and it move both ways? So the my question is, here are two marine mammals. This one fur tells us it helps it to stay warm, but how does this one stay warm? So we can do a little exploration that is in the fur kit called blubber mitts. If you've ever done this before, it's a great activity to show students the difference between uh, what blubber does um, for keeping us warm. And you can make a blubber mitt by taking two Ziploc bags, you turn one inside out and one right side out. And then you can scoop out the contents of some Crisco and put it in the bag that is right side out. Put the inside out one in here. And if you match up the lines, you can essentially make a blood on it. You'll have that lining of uh, fat in between. And then experiment with putting your hands in cold water, two um, tubs of of cold water, one with the blubber, one without. And although you know, your brain probably tells you that you know which one will be warmer, the your students, your learners um, expressions will tell you, wow, that is really dramatic. Blubber is a great adaptation for keeping warm in a marine environment if you don't have the fur for that. Um, that one is a whole lot of fun. And it's found in the fur um, guide as well. And then um, the other activity that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, oh, and here's the um, how blubber mitts is all laid out, step-by-step -step instructions, the materials that you need. If the standards are important to you, it is listed there as well. This is all in the tundra guide as well. So it's easy for you to find. It's in the tundra guide and the fur guide. Next, what about those hairs I was talking about? To do to find out if long ears or short ears help you to stay warm or cool, you can do a little um, exploration with that as well. You, all you need is two buckets, the same size, and two rubber gloves. With one glove, it doesn't have to be these particular type, um, just so long as both of them are the same. With one glove, go ahead and put rubber bands around the fingers like this and keep your other one completely open. Um, so this, what this is kind of mimicking is a smaller area. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you did that blubber lesson. Um, the smaller area that you would have to um, have exposed to the cold. If you're using this glove, you have all of this surface area that is exposed to the cold. And so take your bucket and the same amount of water, take the temperature of the water, put warm water in your gloves, and then the same amount in each glove and then put them in the water to test to see which one loses faster. If you have learners that are saying, um, I want to wear my gloves, I don't want to wear my mittens, this is another example of how you can show them that mittens will keep your hands warmer longer in the winter time. So I'm not going to tell you what turns out there, but I hope that you'll give it a, a go and um, try it out. Most of the inquiry that happens that we talk about in the uh, wildlife curriculum guides are materials that you probably have around the house are very easily found. Um, so I encourage you to give that a shot. Um, you can also check out a skulls guide. Oh my gosh, skulls are so interesting. And it's great if you can expose 
uh, your learners early on to handling skulls because it's also a lesson in having a calm body and being ready to make this observation. And um, you can you can adapt the lesson by just counting the number of teeth and making general observations. One of the things that I like to talk about is okay. This is obviously bigger. And this one is a pine martin. Um, are the eye locations. Eyes in the front, you hunt. Eyes in the side, you hide. So which one of these species hunts is a predator, a meat eater, and which one hides that is a prey species? So this is just one way that you can begin to explore that. Why do these teeth, are the um, beaver's teeth orange on the outside? Why are they chiseled? These are all really great questions that you can begin to investigate with students. I also love looking at the nose holes of these skulls. These terminal bones um, create surface area where more um, nerve endings can attach. So the more bones you have, the better smelling you are. And I'll just tell you now, humans stink at smelling. They do not have very many bones, but many wildlife species do. The more you have, the better smelling you are. So skulls really tell us a tale. And I know that there are some students that might be a little hesitant about seeing different species that they've been warned about because of safety reasons or um, you know, whatever their family stories might be. So we always want to be sensitive to that and be thoughtful, but um, I think that if given the chance, they can have the opportunity to observe and see their friends observing, and the possibility is great that they might, you know, become a little bit closer to make those observations. So I encourage you. Um, let's see. So... One of the things that I've been asking these questions all along, I would encourage you to adopt. To, I wonder, I notice, it reminds me of strategy for inquiry with littles in particular. Because you can say, you can ask any number of yes or no questions. But if you begin the conversation with, I notice this skull has pointed teeth. I wonder what this animal eats. It reminds me of a knife. That strategy helps to keep the end of the question open and the discussion to begin. That also helps them to deliver more ideas and add to the conversation. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Um, lastly, if you want to consider putting some more reading into your lessons, we have Wild Wonders Kids magazines that are available to you for free. You just have to connect um, with our website and just type in Wild Wonders and it'll take you right to the order form. Uh, we've got them on tracks, on furs, and on the last of wild foods. This is a great opportunity for kids to get outside and see what foods we actually have all over Alaska. Um, there are 12 different types of magazines that you can order, track cards as well. Um, so if uh, you have any questions about creating a unit, adding dimension with one of these kits on our kits page, if again, you just go to the Fish and Game website and type in kits, it'll take you right to the conservation education page, whether you're in Juneau um, or anywhere else, we have an educator in that area that can connect you with their kits. Um, go ahead and click on your region and the whole list of kits that belongs to that region will pop up there. So uh, I, if you have any questions, I hope that you'll consider me to be a resource about putting together a unit, how you can get your hands on materials, and um, sometimes I just sit down with the teacher and they say, what you got? And I'm happy to spend some time with you to put together whatever those lessons are or connect you with people. So I think we just have a few more minutes left. If you've got questions, I would be delighted to address those.
for you today. Thanks, Brenna. <clears throat> and as you were mentioning some of those resources, I dropped them here in the chat as well. Um, so we do have a few more minutes. If um, there are any questions, you can feel free to drop them in the chat, or if you want to come off mute, you are welcome to do that also. I took some good notes, but having the, having uh, some notes typed up might be nice too. That sounds great. Kristen, are you asking um, about the adaptations PowerPoint specifically? No, I just mean like the um, resources in general, because I, I have here Department of Fish and Game, you know, check out their website, go to kits, go to conservation, go to check out each region that so I just think, you know, just having that in an email or just typed up somehow as a so I can just search, uh, you know, in my email, I can send it off. To, so it's already pretty. I can send it oh. off to my <laughs> okay. Sorry, absolutely. Um, I will follow up with everyone too with an email. I know there were a lot of um, links I dropped here in the chat. So I can definitely put that all in um, one place in one email and then send that out to everyone. I think we can have that. I can have that out to you by the end of the day, Anna. Yeah. And get some little images so it'll spark the memory. That'd be perfect. Thanks, Brenda. Good idea, Kristen. Um, and as we are waiting, if there's any other questions that people have, I <clears throat> um, first want to thank Brenda. Thank you so much for sharing um, these resources and walking us through a sample lesson, some of the activities that we could all do um, with our learners and with our students. Um, and I appreciate all of you being here with us today. I am going to really quickly drop in the chat. If you can just take a moment, this should maybe take a minute or two. Um, please uh, feel free to take the evaluation for today's workshop. Um, your feedback is greatly appreciated uh, and it helps us improve um, and uh, keep providing trainings that you all are wanting. And we will hang on here for um, a copy of the PowerPoint. Brenda, are you able to provide a copy? Perfect, yeah. So. Um, I'll get that from Brenda and then I will attach that also in the email, um, the follow up email um, later on. Awesome, great. So we'll hang out for a few more minutes if there's any lingering questions, but um, thank you all for being here. And thank you for your work, by the way. I always like to remind people who are doing this extra work with learners after school um, or our caregivers, you know, really you help our, not just our students, but our economy. Um, you help keep kids on track. And I just really appreciate your time and your efforts to make this a meaningful opportunity for them. So good work. Thank you, Rachel.